Back in the spotlight, thanks to a new play at Sacramento's Wilkerson Theater. Well, that's right. Opening night just wrapped up here at the Wilkerson Theater. We know that Dorothea Puente died. The residents of 15th and F Street hated the horrid smell that came from the Victorian Blue Boarding House on 1426 F Street, where different older adults lodged when they complained to the owner. Dorothea Puente. She blamed it on dead rats below the flooring or the fish emulsion she used to fertilize her garden. But when the police were called in over a missing border and noticed a freshly dug grave, they made a chilling discovery of seven victims buried in her well cared for garden. They would eventually tie her to nine murders and she made hundreds of thousands of dollars in social security cashing the checks of her victims. The case of Dorothea Puente will leave you chilled to your bones and the root of her motive for murder, old-fashioned greed. The only question on the lips of the community was, how could no one have noticed the missing older adults? Welcome back to Crime Mystic, where we cover solved, unsolved, and mysterious cases from around the globe. Today, we look at the infamous Death House landlady, a granny serial killer who killed the elderly residents of her boarding house, buried them in her garden, and cashed out their social security checks. Before we go on, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more chilling stories like this and like this video. Now, let's dive into the wicked acts of Dorothea Puente. When the seven bodies were found in the garden of the neighborhood's favorite grandma, the media pieced together her life story, and many soon realized that she had been living a lie. She had said she was 59 when the old lady was actually in her 70s and kept up appearances with facelifts and expensive clothes. Even on the day of the trial, she was adorned with pearls which showed her love for all things luxury. Dorothea Puente was born Dorothea Helen Gray on January 9, 1929. Her father died of tuberculosis when she was eight and her mother, a sex worker, lost custody of her children and died in an accident the next year. She and her siblings were sent to an orphanage where she was abused. She married four times, the first time when she was 16 to Fred McFall, a soldier who had just returned from World War II. They had two daughters, one sent to live with relatives and the other placed for adoption. He eventually left her in 1948 due to her lies and frivolous lifestyle. In the same year, she was arrested for using forged checks and was sentenced to four months in jail and three years of probation. Six months after leaving prison, she skipped town. By 1952, she entered her second marriage with a fake name, Taya Singoala Nayarda, calling herself a Muslim woman from Egypt. She married a seaman, Axel Brand Johansson, but while he was called to sea, she took advantage of the home, inviting men and gambling away their money. The couple would fight and make up repeatedly for 14 years. By 1960, Puente was arrested for operating a bookkeeping firm as a front for a brothel. But when arrested, she claimed she was just visiting a friend and didn't know it was a whorehouse. She was found guilty and sentenced to 90 days in jail. The next year, her husband had her committed to DeWitt State Hospital due to her lying, drinking, criminal acts and suicide attempts. The doctors diagnosed her as a pathological liar with a disturbing personality. Even after she and Johansson divorced in 1966, Puente took up the identity of Sharon Johansson and pretended to be a devout Christian woman, providing a sanctuary to young women who suffered from abuse. By 1968, Dorothea married Roberto Jose Puente, but they separated after 16 months. After ups and downs and a restraining order filed by her, they finally divorced in 1973. Dorothea continued to use the surname Puente until she was discovered to be a serial killer. After her third divorce, Dorothea Puente ran a boarding house at 1426 F Street in Sacramento. She changed her public image and everyone knew her as a well-loved and respectable granny they could trust. She worked with politicians and funded charities, radio programs, and scholarships. She also married Pedro Montalvo, one of her boarders, but he left a week later. No one knew of her dark past, especially that she was ordered by the court never to cash government checks or do work near older adults. It would eventually come to light that she was nothing close to a sweet old lady. Chilling discovery at the Sacramento boarding house. On November 11, 1988, Detective John Carbera and other police officers visited 1426 F Street in search of one of their boarders, Alvaro Bert Montoya. But what they discovered was more than they could ever expect. Seven bodies buried in the yard of the nice old lady. Montoya was Puente's latest victim and the freshly dug grave in her garden caught the attention of the detectives. Montoya had a troubled background and had been homeless for years, so when Puente told his social worker that 
he had left to live with his brother-in-law. She didn't believe the older woman. The social worker questioned some tenants, and John Sharp told her that Puente had been digging many holes. Puente had also asked Donald Anthony, a former convict who worked in her yard, to call the social worker and pretend to be Montoya's brother. But when he called, he said the wrong name, making the social worker even more suspicious. And so, the police were called. When the detectives asked Puente if they could search the house, she did not hesitate to let them in. But when they noticed the grave, they began digging and noticed scraps of cloth and what looked like beef jerky. Detective Cabrera struggled to dig the hole due to a tree root blocking it, so he jabbed it with a shovel, climbed down the hole, and wrapped his arm around the strange item in the hole. When he eventually pulled it out, he was met with a human bone that would send shivers down his spine. He yelled and jumped out of the hole. His loud noise attracted the landlady to come out of the house and into the yard. When she was told that a human bone was buried in her yard, detectives would later report that she looked genuinely surprised and told him she knew nothing about it without missing a beat. The police returned the next day with the full cavalry, a team of forensic anthropologists coroner officials, and a county work crew completely excavating her garden. The entire neighborhood watched with bated breath, shocked and appalled by the bodies being found, and the media gathered the house, screaming questions that had no answer. But Dorothy Puente was surprisingly calm and not at all shocked. All she did was look at a police officer and ask if she was under arrest. When he said no, she said she would like to go to the nearby hotel and have some tea. The detectives did not suspect Dorothy Puente initially, as she was just a fragile old woman who had also become the pillar of the community. Many social workers depended on her to care for their clients because, as some would later say, she was the best the system had to offer. No one would have guessed that she was cashing out their checks and committing murder, getting up to $5,000 monthly to spend on her expensive champagne and facelifts. So when she asked if she could get some tea, which was after the police had discovered the body of Leona Carpenter, she was allowed to go. It was not until later the police realized that she had fled and would not be found until five days later. As the case unfolded, the secrets of Puente's past and her evil doings would eventually come to light. Probation officers and social workers realized the lies she had been telling them. Even one of her first victims, Malcolm McKenzie, a 74-year-old man she picked up from the bar, would eventually report that she had drugged him and robbed him of his coins, jewelry, and watch while he watched. Some social workers reported that some of their clients had complained about the drugs that Puente gave to them, but many of them had argued their clients to remain in the boarding house as there was no other option. One would eventually tell the court, I told him he was safe there. I would have to live with that for the rest of my life. Even the carpenter realized that the six foot long box she had asked him to build to fill up with books and other assorted items was a coffin. On the way to the storage facility, Puente had asked the carpenter to push the box into the water instead, and it was later discovered to hold the body of Everson Theodore Gilmouth. Another one of her boarders reported that he had helped her dig holes, which he stated was for apricot trees. He had wondered why they were so deep, but didn't ask for the questions. The disturbing uncovering of bodies in Puente's garden and the other two murders linked to her opened up the case of shadow people, older adults who were alcoholics or addicts, often disappeared and no one noticed. These people slipped through the cracks of the social system and eventually ended up at the mercy of the cruel woman. She had been connected to several murders. Her friend and business partner, Ruth Monroe, was found dead on April 28, 1982 by a drug overdose. She was reportedly in good health when she arrived at the boarding home, but by April 25th, she mysteriously told a friend, I feel like I'm going to die. Then, Dorothy Osborne, one of her tenants, eventually fell ill and died. Everson Theodore Gilmouth was another one, and the second victim who was found in her garden with unsuspecting flowers growing over his corpse. She had killed Betty Mae Palmer, 78, a resident of her boarding house, and her head, lower legs, and hands were never found. Leona Carpenter, a boarder whose power of attorney was given to Puente, was found buried in the southeast corner of the yard. James Gallup, a resident with a tumor, was buried under the gazebo of a yard. She had told the hospital that he went to Los Angeles instead. Eugene Gamel also lived in the boarding house, and although his death was ruled a suicide, it was still speculated that Puente could have murdered him. Then, Vera Faye Martin was sent to live with Puente, and the landlady got over $7,000 from her social security checks. Her body was found under the metal shed in the yard. Dorothy Miller, another victim, was also found buried under a slab of concrete near some rose bushes in the yard. She had even hired a carpet cleaner 
to remove the foul-smelling slime in Milka's room in November 1987. Benjamin Fink was also buried in the metal shed, which was later filled with concrete. Tenants had reported a foul odor coming from Fink's room, but Puente said it was a sewer backup. Alvaro Bert Montoya, the victim who blew the case open, was buried in the yard. These unfortunate victims would eventually be recovered from the yard of the death house landlady. After fleeing for five days, Dorothy Puente would eventually be found in LA. She had met Charles Williams at a bar and pretended to be a widow who had been robbed of her belongings. He took pity on her, repaired her shoes, and bought her food. They also had plans to go shopping the next day. While he wondered why she repeatedly asked him how much he earned from his social security checks, and even pushed him to live with her. He would not realize who he was talking to until he saw the news that night. Dorothea Puente was arrested on November 16, 1988, after Williams alerted the media, who in turn alerted the police of her whereabouts. She was first charged with the murder of Montoya, but by October 19, 1992, she was charged with nine murder counts. Puente's lawyer maintained their non-guilty stance, only pleading guilty to the burying of the bodies and cashing out the checks. He stated, that the tenants died of natural causes and she only buried them secretly because she was not allowed to be close to older adults. But the prosecutor, John O'Mara, remained blunt in his summation and outlook of the case. He stated that this was simply a case of predatory greed. Puente repeatedly said that she didn't kill anyone, saying, I used to be a very good person at one time, but while her lawyers painted her as a poor old lady, prosecutors stated that she was one of the most cold and calculating female killers the country had ever seen. She was eventually convicted of three murders and sent to prison for life. By age 82, she died of natural causes at the Central California Women's Facility. One of the detectives in the Puente case would later say in a documentary, this could be my grandma. She was the little old lady next door. You cannot judge a book by its cover, and she had one heck of a cover. The disturbing case of Dorothea Puente not only shook the country, but also prompted attention to be given to the social security system and older adults. Many wondered how the social workers never suspected anything, and how her parole officers could believe the people in her home were simply friends and not boarders. Even in prison, Puente insisted that she cared for the tenants and never killed anyone. She even stated that the boarders were already sick when they came to her, so they weren't expected to live. This is a story of cold, hard murder, greed, and of course, deceiving appearances. Let us know what you think in the comments below.